Uh, well, uh, thank you, Sarah, for joining me uh, today. Uh, for folks on the horn or listening later, um, my name is Ben Edgerly Walsh. I run VPIRG's Climate and Energy Program, and I'm joined today by uh, Sarah Copeland Hansis, who is uh, the co chair of the Climate Solutions Caucus, as well as being the chair of the House Government Operations Committee. Uh, so thanks so much, Sarah. Yeah, it's great to be here. Well, it is uh, good to have you. Uh, it was good to catch up a little bit earlier. Um, Sarah, Sarah and I work together very closely uh, in normal times uh, and with, you know, both, you know, my, my colleagues in the office, legislators that I normally see, uh, you know, hours every day in the state house. It's uh, been very weird uh, to be, uh, you know, stuck in my uh, home, uh, as I know everyone else has been experienced as well. As well. So it's good to see you. Um, but let's just dive right in. Uh, so uh, before we start start talking about uh, climate issues, about some of the stuff that your committee has been working on, I just wanted to ask, you know, how are things uh, going in Bradford? You know, how are you holding up as a, um, you know, just as an individual, as a small business owner, and as a mom? Well, I can tell you that, that this new reality that we're working in is, uh, is strange and a little hard to adapt to. You know, you and I are used to having, you know, five or 10 quick exchanges of information every single day. Um, we're used to being able to find each other and, you know, impart an update, you know, sort of at our leisure. Um, I think that that same that same expectation of the continuous contact and collaboration is something that we're having trouble adapting to, you know, just having to be so much more intentional. Um, working at home is definitely interesting and, you know, I would be out in the garden a whole lot more if it would ever warm up and stop snowing and raining. <laughs> but they say April showers, so I'm, I'm holding out hope that, uh, that May will be a little bit nicer. Yeah, I hear that. Uh, my uh, son, uh, my my daughter is a year and a half, as you know, so she's uh, mostly just pulling up grass and we're trying to keep it out of her mouth. But uh, <laughs> my son who's four and a half and uh, my wife and I have been getting in the garden as much as we can um, and eating a little bit of salad greens from uh, um, some indoor stuff. So that's, nice. it's been nice. I've been trying to find like the little uh, silver linings in this giant gray cloud that we're all living in right now. It's true. Um, so the, the next question I've got, and then we will dive into more of the, you know, sort of programmatic uh, uh, topical uh, questions is, I know that legislators around the state have sort of become, uh, you know, field offices or constituent services offices, you know, 180 of you around the state. I know that's something you do in normal times, you know, help, helping people navigate state programs. Um, but from what I've heard, that's become a huge part of your lives, uh, you know, over and above anything that you're getting paid for. Um, so if there's anything you'd like to share about what you've been hearing from your constituents, I'm sure that's something that folks listening with, in would love to, to hear about. Yeah, you know, it's, it's become really real really quickly that um, the safety net of government is something that we want to have at the ready and, um, and ready to function appropriately and efficiently on behalf of its citizens. And so that has been one of the greatest challenges is just recognizing that we were not prepared for something of this, uh, of this magnitude. And, uh, and so it's been a lot of trying to help and guide, you know, I've got small business people from any number of different sectors of the economy, you know, asking questions about, you know, what does shutdown mean? What are we allowed to do? What can't we do? What's safe? Uh, when will we be allowed to go back to work? So there's just a lot of heightened anxiety. And, uh, and in and among that, you know, uh, there's a lot of legislators who are, um, you know, trying to figure out how to support their neighbors and connect them with the resources that they need. So, you know, if you're having any trouble connecting with, um, with resources, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to your, uh, your house member. Um, and if he or she isn't able to help you, you can reach out to me because I'm a glutton for, <laughs> for a challenge and, and uh, happy to try to help. Now, I remember uh, last fall you were driving to pretty much every corner of the state for the uh, 
Climate Solutions Caucus uh, town halls, as it were. Uh, so uh, I, that offer does not surprise me, um, you know, knowing your history. Uh, I'll also say um, we've had other webinars, uh, and this is not so much for you as other folks listening, uh, that are sort of more directly focused on, uh, you know, what's the immediate response been uh, to the COVID crisis? How can people access different services? I was uh, on a call with uh, one of uh, Bernie Sanders staffers last week. So folks can, you know, go back and listen to those webinars if they're looking for more of those kinds of resources. Uh, and then BPIRG also has a page that we put up about uh, COVID-19 specific resources, you know, volunteer opportunities, things like that. So mm -hmm. we'll put a link down below uh, to that a little bit later. Great. Um, so shifting gears and, you know, talking a little bit more about climate, which is what you and I talk about most of the time in normal times. Um, you're obviously the chair of the, uh, the co-chair of the Climate Solutions Caucus. That's how most VPIRG members uh, probably know you. Uh, can you speak a little bit to how the caucus has been approaching its role in these times uh, beyond the obvious ways in which as individual legislators you've been helping your constituents or you know, legislating on the more uh, you know direct immediate emergency response uh, bills that you have already passed you know so how, how have you been operating as a, a caucus or how might you be operating as a caucus going forward that's a great question. Um, so, you know, we have we have put a, a significant pause on our regular meeting times. Uh, we would ordinarily meet every Thursday at um, at noon when we're at the state house, and we would uh, Senator Pearson and I would ordinarily put out our our weekly climate update uh, every every weekend, just letting people know the progress. But we have we've put those sorts of activities on hold while we're trying to evaluate, you know, what is what does the emergency response look like? What do we need to be doing for our communities? But in and among that, you know, I've got members of the Climate Caucus who are reaching out to me and, you know, sending me information and articles, sending me ideas. And, you know, I'm, I'm really, um, you know, I'm heartened to see that, that not unlike me, other members of the Climate Caucus are still really uh, engaged and committed to moving forward with uh, helping Vermonters uh, reduce their reliance on fossil fuels. And, um, and so while we're in a pause in terms of, of actually uh, advancing any legislation at the moment, um, we are still talking and thinking about uh, the ways that we can come out of this at a, at a full sprint um, in terms of meeting our climate goals. Yeah, it's been, that's, that's really good to hear. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't, again, surprise me one bit. Um, I'll just say it's been, you know, I, I want to use the word interesting, but <laughs> that feels a bit um, inappropriate in this time because, you know, there are, you know, people who, many, many people who, uh, you know, listening to this, who, you know, know folks who've been sick or even have lost loved ones. Um, uh, but at the same time, there are other crises unfolding. Uh, and, you know, I was reading an article a few days ago, I think it was in the New York Times, where, that was looking at uh, some peer-reviewed research uh, or some research that had been looking into how air pollution actually has increased the death rate from COVID-19, that there are very direct links between some of the problems that we have been trying to solve and this particular crisis that's in front of us today. Um, it, it really drove home for me that while uh, there is this Im immediate crisis that absolutely must be addressed, and that's why, you know, both of us are talking right now from our respective homes, you know, practicing responsible social distancing, uh, the other crises that uh, we have to address are not going away, even if they have sort of shifted to the background uh, for the moment. Um, and so that sort of brings me to my next question. Uh, you mentioned the, um, the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, as I'm sure many folks listening in know, earlier this year, the Vermont House of Representatives passed uh, that bill, which would set economy-wide uh, requirements for reductions in climate pollution uh, by 105 to 37 uh, margin. That was really exciting to see. Uh, and that was due in large part to the 
you know, grassroots energy behind climate action, you know, people in every corner of the state demanding that we finally take this crisis seriously. Um, you know, obviously there's been a pause, as you said, on non-COVID related legislation for very good reasons, both logistical and in terms of, you know, what our state's priorities have to be in this moment. Um, but that isn't going to last forever. And so I'd love uh, for you to share anything you can about, you know, what the future for that bill might be, um, you know, where it's at now and, and where it might be headed, because I know that, you know, our members are very interested in still seeing that become law. Absolutely. Well, there's, you know, there's the Global Warming Solutions Act really is, uh, it, it does two things. Uh, one, it, uh, it prioritizes resilience. It prioritizes community response to climate change generally. And, um, and, I, and I can't help but, uh, but believe that this coronavirus um, uh, is, is in some ways a, a practice session for us to figure out what does community resilience look, look like? How do we support our neighbors in a crisis? Uh, what, what is truly important? Um, you know, when, when the people who are deemed essential workers are the, you know, the grocery store clerks and the, and the delivery drivers, um, you know, that, that is a, a real, <laughs> it's a, a real fundamental wake up call that, that, that is, uh, that's what's important for us. So we, we really are thinking about at this moment in coronavirus land, we're thinking about, you know, how do we come together as a resilient community? That's, that is one of the main areas of focus of the Global Warming Solutions Act, recognizing that uh, when Tropical Storm Irene hit, um, that, uh, that communities who were able to quickly mobilize those kinds of supports did a lot better than uh, communities who, who had none of that fabric. Uh, but the other thing that, uh, that the Global Warming Solutions Act does is, um, is it's the planning document. You know, it's, it's setting up a, a, a climate council who will come together and plan for the kinds of um, things that we need to do as a state in order to help Vermonters shift away from using fossil fuels. And um, the, the, the biggest uh, opportunity that I can see, the biggest silver lining that I can see in, in this great big gray cloud that we've been dealing with for the last six weeks is that when we come out of this and we need to restart the economy, uh, the federal government will likely um, send much more stimulus money out into the states. It will come in the form of infrastructure money that we can uh, be prepared to invest in ways that are uh, advantageous to the climate as opposed to investing them in, uh, in staying in the same old fossil fuel uh, um, fueled rut that we've been in for the last hundred something years. So um, that, that resilience aspect and that planning aspect really say to me that this, this bill is one that needs to be um, prioritized in terms of moving sooner rather than later so that we can start those activities. If you remember back to the, to the stimulus package that came, the, the era money that came after the economic collapse uh, in 2008, um, though, those uh, dollars went out to the states looking for shovel-ready projects, right? So we need to be thinking right now about what are our shovel-ready projects that will, uh, that will also meet the goal of reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. So um, projects like uh, weatherizing homes and projects like building out EV infrastructure, uh, charging infrastructure, projects like, uh, like actually accomplishing complete streets so that you can be a bicyclist or a pedestrian along the roadway, you don't have to always get in your car and drive a mile to the post office, but you could very easily and safely ride your bike there or walk there. And so these are all, um, these are all opportunities uh, for the future. And if we can uh, get ourselves in planning mode sooner rather than later, I think we, uh, we will find that we can make some great progress. Yeah, that, that definitely sounds right to me. I, a couple of things that you mentioned that sort of struck me. Um, one was the parallels with the experience that we went through with Tropical Storm Irene. Now, obviously, that was in a very different type of disaster. Uh, but one thing that seems like it should be a common thread, something that we did 
not perfectly, but fairly well coming out of Irene uh, and trying to recover as a state from that disaster. Uh, you know, we, there's an incredible need to make the current situation less bad as quickly as possible. There's an incredible need to dig out of the hole, uh, you know, climb out of the hole that we are now in economically. Um, and that was true during Irene as well, but I think we need to resist the temptation to just get back to the status quo. And, you know, this is a small example, but something that I think was done very well during, uh, or in the aftermath of Tropical Storm Irene, was making sure that we took a step back and we looked at, you know, how this crisis had happened and how the next one, even if you ex put the exact same storm over Vermont, the exact same circumstances, could be less bad for Vermonters? How could we be more resilient? Box culverts, right? You know, yeah. we fought the federal government tooth and nail to get FEMA money so that roads didn't wash out the next time we had a tropical storm, Irene. And, you know, thank goodness that hasn't happened again, but we know it will, and we know that we're better prepared because of it. And so in this moment where we are sort of trying to climb out of this hole, it does feel like there is this incredible opportunity and need to make our state more resilient, not just to the next pandemic, but the, to the climate crisis, to the demographic challenges we're facing, to all of the, th the things that we know we need to address anyway. Um, so if, if there's anything more you wanna say on that top, top, topic of resilience and how the Solutions Act uh, particularly digs into that, um, you know, I, I, I think that'd be great uh, if, if there's anything more that you wanna dig into there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one of the other things that is coming um, very clear right in front of us is, you know, when you, when you for the first time go to the grocery store for, you know, day after day after day and see empty food shelves, um, it really does call into question, you know, are we doing as much as we should be doing um, at, uh, at improving our food independence here as a state. Uh, we have uh, an agricultural sector that's based primarily on dairy and, and those farms are in a really uh, tough way right now. Um, uh, but if we really value our independence here and our ability to be self-sufficient in the, in the face of a crisis, um, it, it does present an opportunity for us to think of bringing agriculture into our, our definition of, uh, of what's important to invest in, in, in a state. So, you know, the, the Global Warming Solutions Act was, uh, was very strongly supported in the House. And as you said, in large part because of the grassroots um, organizing that was done. Um, and I, I wanna think that we can, again, have conversations around the state of Vermont right now about what do we wanna prioritize coming out of the coronavirus pandemic. What what do we, what parts of where we were as a state before do we want to hold on to, and what parts do we want to get rid of? And so I'm hoping that people are uh, are are interested in engaging in those conversations because uh, Vermonters come up with some pretty cool ideas when you give them the opportunity to to think through a challenge. And uh, I don't know about you, but I seem to have plenty of time to ponder <laughs> things in between emails and phone calls and Zoom meetings. Yeah, yeah. The, um, so the other thing, and I do wanna shift gears in a moment and talk about that grassroots uh, support that was so integral to getting, you know, as, as far as we have gotten on the Solutions Act. Um, but the other thing I just wanted to highlight for folks that you mentioned is this idea of the Solutions Act being a planning bill. Uh, it, I'm reminded of, and I forget who the exact quote, you know, the quote is from, but this idea of, you know, the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago, ago the next best time is today. Uh, and you certainly don't want to wait any longer than that. Right. You know, that, that feels very appropriate right now. If we had passed something like this, you know, five or 10 years ago, we would be perfectly positioned to take advantage of the, uh, the need to build a more resilient economy and state um, going forward. But if we get that work underway today, I think we can get pretty close to that, you know, with a lot of creative thinking, a lot of hard work over the next year, um, you know, if that bill passes, I, I do think uh, we really could build a state that's more resilient, again, to the next pandemic, to the next climate disaster, uh, come what may. Um, and then the other thing on that resilience piece that I just wanted to highlight for folks, 
you, you mentioned it, but um, it really is a key part of the bill. And I want to mo make sure folks uh, are aware of that. How much of the Global Warming Solutions Act really is about rural communities and making sure that this transition to clean energy, transition to efficiency, uh, and transition to a more resilient economy is something that works for all Vermonters and all Vermont communities. Um, you know, you, you read reports about preparedness for this pandemic, and thank God we've dodged this bullet in Vermont, but how difficult it would be to weather it in rural communities that have difficulty accessing healthcare. Um, you know, if we can make those communities that are more vulnerable to pandemics, more vulnerable to uh, you know, tropical storms and hurricanes because of the uh, relative lack of infrastructure they have, more resilient, that is better for everyone. And I'm, I'm really excited to see how, so, how that idea was so thoroughly baked into the Solutions Act. Um, but, but I do want to shift gears and talk a little bit more about uh, grassroots activism. I know that's something that you, you know, value very deeply and something that was really critical to the momentum around climate this year and the commitments that the legislature and the governor made to make climate action a priority. So, you know, obviously we're in this moment where we're not having rallies, we're not asking people to come to the state house and sit down across a lunchroom table with their representative and ask them to support climate action. Um, but there are a lot of things that people can do despite all of that. So what advice do you have for folks who wanna see climate action happen, but are struggling to figure out exactly how they can influence things in this day and age? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that there's two ways that people should go um, with their energy around that. Um, one way is to reach out to your neighbors. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what we lamented as we were uh, going around to the different communities in Vermont during the road show was, you know, there, there are, are so many people who are passionate about solving the climate crisis, but in their normal day-to-day -day life of getting home from work, you know, picking the kids up at daycare, getting dinner on the table, get the kids off to bed and phew, now I'm just too tired to engage in anything. And, um, and so for many people right now, there is, uh, for better or for worse, uh, a different rhythm of life and a different ability for people to engage in, uh, in conversations about this. So I would just encourage people uh, at appropriate, you know, safe distances, you know, across the backyard fence or, um, or when you, uh, happen across somebody, uh, you know, as you're going for a walk down the street is, you know, engage with your neighbors and find out how they're feeling about um, about working from home. You know, how's your internet connection? How are we doing at making sure that we don't have to, to commute every day, that we can actually telecommute some? And that's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, but it's also an engagement point for people to talk about, hey, you know, Maybe I don't need to drive to the grocery store three or four or five days a week. Maybe I don't need to, um, you know, go out to the movies, uh, you know, every weekend. Maybe, you know, maybe I can engage in a, you know, in a slightly different pace of life. Um, so engaging with your neighbors on those issues is, is, uh, is definitely um, an opportunity. But then I would say, you know, make use of all of the electronic means that we have for communicating and make your views known to your elected officials. Make your views known to the governor, to your uh, house member, to your senator, and to the congressional delegation because right now their staffers are in the middle of beginning negotiations around the next set of um, of stimulus money that's going to come out into our communities. What do you want it to look like? What do you want it to prioritize? Do you want it to, to help us uh, accelerate our transition to renewable energy and energy independence? Or do you want it to, to look like, um, you know, bailing out the, the fossil fuel companies and, uh, and the conventional automobile uh, way of life? Um, so it's, you know, Elected officials, it's our job to listen to what, uh, to what our constituents say. And um, so to the extent that you have time on your hands, 
I would say engage with neighbors and let your elected officials know what you think is important. That sounds, yeah, that definitely sounds right to me. And I, I'd also say that, you know, as we're slowly moving out of the initial you know, crisis response phase, now, to be clear, I understand that people's lives are dramatically different than they were, you know, weeks ago, uh, let alone, you know, bef before, you know, late last year when no one had ever even heard the term uh, COVID-19. Um, but there is uh, a degree to which, you know, we have flattened the curve. The government is slowly starting to get programs like uninsurance, um, unemployment insurance under control. Thank God, you know, we are, uh, because of the precautions we've taken as a state, seeing fewer and fewer cases on average every day um, diagnosed. And so it does feel like we're moving into a time where slowly, like elected officials like yourself are, are going to be able to spend a little bit more time on the, you know, other needs of this state that are not uh, the immediate, uh, you know, dire circumstances that we're under. So um, that's just a, a to encourage folks, you know, to, to be aware of what's going on in the world. You, you know, even in the best of times, we always tell our members when they're talking to legislators, like, if you're going to the state house, know what else is going on in the building. Is there a big vote on the floor right. of the house on, you know, another bill? Don't, don't pretend like your issues are the only thing that's going on in the world. Um, that's obviously more true than ever right now. But at the same time, you know, look and see what's going on. And, understand if your legislator has the time to talk to you or maybe you send them an email and say you know i'd love to talk to you in a few weeks when you might have a little bit more space for that mm -hmm. so yeah. uh but definitely uh you know could not agree more that there are still tools out there and and we'll be letting uh Vipurg members in particular know is um there are sort of more digital ways to engage with people and we think uh, you know the time is right to to do that um so I guess let me just pause and ask um, before I wanted to shift gears and talk about a couple of the things that are going on or have been going on recently uh, in your actual committee, uh, which is not one focused on climate. Um, but is there anything else in particular that you'd like to touch on uh, as it relates to you know, climate crisis or legislation related to that? Yeah, you know, it is, it's been, um, it, it's been a, a period of mourning for, for many of us who work so hard to get a whole suite of climate bills on the agenda to, uh, to, to understand that because of this immediate crisis, we're not going to be able to advance everything that we hoped we could. Um, but I think, that, um, I think that we can all come together and, um, and put our, uh, our energy and our focus behind the, the planning and the resilience focus of the Global Warming Solutions Act. And so I would just hope that, that, um, that folks can, uh, can put their energy behind that in the same way that, uh, that they have been coming out to engage with us right along about a whole suite of bills. And I promise you, we're gonna get back to these other issues um, just as soon as we can. Well, you're here. Um, so again, shifting gears a bit, um, Obviously, you know this. I think probably not everyone on the call does, but you're the chair of government operations in the House, and GovOps, as folks in the State House often call it, uh, has jurisdiction over elections, uh, mm -hmm. obviously. And one of the first pieces of legislation uh, that was passed uh, by the legislature in response to the uh, COVID 19 crisis, uh, which we, review, we at BPERG were very heartened to see, uh, was one that would help ensure that the Secretary of State uh, as the uh, you know, chief elections officer in Vermont had the tools at his disposal to ensure a safe, secure election for Vermont, even in the middle of a pandemic and social distancing and all the rest. So obviously that's a bill that went through your committee. I know your committee did a lot of work on it. Uh, I'd love uh, for you to share um, you know, anything you'd like on that piece of legislation, uh, you know, what, uh, might Vermonters, you know, expect going forward, um, and how how can we ensure that we have a, a safe election season here in Vermont? Yeah, that's a great question, and and um, 
And it's one that I'm really happy to have been able to be in the center of as chair of GovOps because, uh, you know, what, what is more fundamental and important to our democracy than your right to go to the polls and, uh, and choose your elected officials. And um, it was really, um, it was really something that the Secretary of State immediately jumped on. You know, he, he came over to the State House with his um, Deputy Secretary the, the, a day or two before we suspended in-person meetings in the legislature and he said, look, this is the way I see it. We've got a pandemic. If we look at how the, the disease has played out in other countries, uh, you know, we could be threatened by not being able to have an in-person election and here's what I think we need to be working on. And so, you know, Jim Condos, you know, gets a, a big, a big round of applause and thumbs up from me for being so uh, forward thinking about, uh, about making sure that we have uh, the ability to exercise our right to the ballot box. And um, so what I, I think it would be helpful for folks on, on the, this meeting to know is that the Secretary of State's elections folks intend to make a decision about whether to say that the August primary is going to be um, uh, vote by mail versus in-person voting or some other form of, um, of voting. He's gonna make that call by the end of April. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, they need to be able to go out to the vendor who needs to print the ballots and, and then also be printing envelopes for all of those ballots as well. And uh, as some folks might know, typical turnout for, um, for a primary is, uh, is you know, 25% of the, the voters. And so uh, if we're talking about universal, uh, you know, mail out your ballot to every single voter, um, we're gonna be looking at really great participation numbers. And I think it's fascinating and really exciting to think about the fact that every single one of my neighbors will have a ballot in their hand, right? And, you know, it, it, sometimes I'm actually standing out at election day texting my friends who I know haven't been to vote yet because I've been standing there all day and, and you know, like cajoling them to get out to vote. And so this idea that we're going to put a ballot in every Vermonter's uh, mailbox so they can sit down at their kitchen table and think about who they want to vote for is just a really tremendous opportunity. And honestly, I... <laughs> I, I really hope that we have the opportunity to practice this um, by, by our August primary because I think it could be a really, uh, a really good way of stimulating participation in our democracy. Yeah, at, at VPIRG we couldn't agree more. Um, we have worked on, as you know, uh, elections uh, access, voting rights for a very long time. Um, some of the reforms that um, you know we supported over the years through you know many different uh, GovOps committees and GovOps chairs uh, are you know part of the reason that we're in a position where we could rapidly move to universal vote by mail that most Vermonters are already registered um, that you know we have uh, sort of quote unquote no excuse uh, vote by mail already uh, you know 30% of Vermonters voted by mail in the I think the last election so. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick plug uh, for a petition that we have. Uh, obviously, you know, the Secretary of State is going to make a decision uh, you know, on what he uh, thinks is the best path, path forward for safe elections in Vermont at VPIRG. Uh, we are calling for universal vote by mail. What that means to us is, as you said, that everyone would get a ballot in the mail, every registered voter in the state of Vermont. Uh, number two, that there is still uh, in-person voting available for those who need it, uh, that it's done safely in a way that allows social distancing, that uh, makes sure that poll workers who are oftentimes uh, fairly elderly Vermonters who are volunteering their time are not put in harm's way unnecessarily by people showing up to the polls uh, in sort of the traditional way with you know big surges of people around lunch and after uh, work on election day. Um, but, you know, that in-person voting is important to some people, you know, Vermonters with disabilities, uh, you know, first American communities, 
uh, some other Vermonters who just would ha struggle to access, uh, you know, vote by mail. Um, but for the vast majority of Vermonters, that's a good option, and it's the most responsible option from our perspective, if that's something you can do. And then the third sort of leg of that stool from our perspective is a lot, a lot of voter education to make sure everyone understands what their options are and how all of this is going to work. So uh, we have a petition. We'll put a link below, and you can find it on our website uh, that we're asking people to sign uh, to the governor and to Secretary of State Jim Condos, urging them to take those measures uh, well in advance of the August primary. And obviously, we'll see in about 10 days uh, you know, where they land on that. Um, but we'll be delivering that in, in a few days. So still time to sign that. Um, before we wrap up, I'd uh, love to just ask, is there anything else that you'd recommend uh, other things that Vermonters could do if they're interested in making sure that our elections are run as safely as possible? Are there opportunities for people to engage beyond that, you know, just voting themselves by mail and signing that petition? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there definitely are because I don't know about your community, but certainly in my community, the the people who work in the polls are um, are pretty consistent from election to election. You know, these are people who passionately believe in the the civic duty to 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 get out and vote, and they and they come and volunteer every single year. But but you know, many of them um, tend to be in the demographic who's hardest hit by this uh, by this virus. And so my my um, call to a local town clerk was, you know, have you have you given any thought to this? What do you you know what do you think is going to happen if you know if we go to mostly mail balloting, but we still have to have people you know there feeding the 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 mailed ballots into the uh, into the to tabulator, or um, or you still have to have a, a small crew in order to allow for in person voting for people who. Who didn't receive their mail ballot you know what do you want to do with that and she said to me what i really mostly want is a new crop of volunteers to come and be trained uh and and i don't know if folks understand this but your town clerk is your local elections administrator and he or she is responsible for training all of those wonderful kind volunteers who who check the checklist make sure your name is on it hand you a ballot then there's another person who checks you out and watches you feed the ballot into the tabulator. Um, all of those people uh, are just ordinary citizens. And so if, if you're so inspired to, uh, to help make this uh, election go smoother, please reach out to your town clerk now and say, hey, can I be trained to be um, an, a poll worker on election day so that, you know, maybe we can have more, uh, more bodies uh, available to do that so that some of these people can work shorter shifts or maybe um, you know maybe older folks would rather stay home and and have some of the younger folks uh, volunteer for for the, for the full working that day so I would say get out and volunteer your town clerk will appreciate it thank you yeah that's definitely a, an idea well taken um, something that I'll you know personally consider um, you know going up to the August and November elections. Um, I know, you know, here in Montpelier where I live, um, yeah, it's folks, you, you said, as you said, they've been doing it year after year and some of them for quite a lot of years in a row. Uh, so I think there is really an opportunity and a need for uh, uh, maybe a younger generation to step up and say, you know, I'm statistically a little bit less at risk from being in a place where I'm going to be put in to in-person contact with people. And, uh, you know, I'm willing to, you know, step up and help my community and, um, some of the people who have made elections uh, possible for so many years uh, in this moment where I'm perhaps needed. So um, thank you for all the work that you did on that, uh, that bill and elections. And obviously, uh, you know, all of the work that you've done over the years on climate. Um, I do want to just say sort of a blanket. If there's anything else that you want to touch on before we wrap up, I Certainly uh, would uh, love to give you the opportunity. The floor is yours. Oh. Um, and if not, it's been a wonderful conversation. Well, thank you. Um, I, I guess I would just want to repeat the call that, you know, if, if you're out there and, and you've got concerns or needs that aren't being met and, uh, and you can't figure out uh, how to access those resources, please don't hesitate to reach out to your elected official or to me if you can't find him or her. Um, you know, we're all in this together. And one of the, one of the most wonderful things about being um, a house uh, 
member from Vermont is that we are really close to our communities and, and our communities have access to state government in a way that just isn't the case in most other places. And so um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't offer it lightly, but if you need anything, don't hesitate to reach out because that's what we're here for. Well, again, thank you for everything that you're doing right now. And, and thanks for taking the time. I know, um, you know you have a lot on your plate right now uh, and uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was great to chat climate. I'm, I'm uh, really excited also to, to chat elections. And so I look forward to seeing all those names on the petition to, uh, to, to move forward with universal mail balloting. Absolutely. Well, have a good night, Sarah. Thanks so much. Thank you.